Today is about mammalian synthetic biology by control designs. So please join me welcoming her. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. Yes, so today I will talk about um, controller design in the context of uh, mammalian uh, synthetic genetic circuits. And you see the focus is going to be about making uh, genetic circuit behavior more predictable and especially robust to the uncertainty that we have in the cell context. Mm -hmm. So before I go there, so since not everybody may be familiar with synthetic biology or engineering biology, I will give one slide of introduction about what are the exciting applications of the field. So in the very short term, we have application mostly using cell-free um, systems where you essentially extract from the cell all the cytoplasm with its machinery to create circuits in vitro. Mm -hmm. And one of the major applications I will say is uh, cell-free virus detection that was used in 2015, for example, to detect Zika or Ebola, and that's from MIT, uh, from the Collins group. And that's for essentially on-site diagnostic. In the medium term, we have applications that are engineering bacteria mm -hmm. for situations where the bacteria have to interface with the human body. So in the top figure here, you see engineered bacteria that have uh, been engineered such that they can sense the tumor when they are injected in the bloodstream. And once they are at the tumor, they recognize that the tumor is there, they lice open and they release killing agents so that you can see from the pictures that essentially the tumor decreases. So this is work done mostly by Tal Danino. And then in the bottom here, you have the engineered microbiome. So here it's a very um, uh, highly expanding area. And the notion is to engineer bacteria that can sense biomarkers, for example, for illnesses such as inflammatory bowel disease or at high level of stress. And then they can release drugs in order to compensate for such imbalances. And um, this is a very uh, research intensive area, especially for applications that relate to increasing human performance. Mm -hmm. In the very long term, we have the applications where you really want to engineer the circuits inside the mammalian cells, so like human cells. So in the top one, I have a picture here of what's called engineered living materials, which is where you engineer mammalian cells such that they are undifferentiated, but once they are, for example, uh, relocated on a place, they realize what cell types it's around them and they become the same cell type, okay? In the bottom, uh, it's a very long-term vision for reprogram patient-specific cells where people would like to extract cells from a patient, such as skin cells, mm -hmm. um, undifferentiate them and differentiate them back to whatever cell type is needed. For example, beta cells, if diabetes is the issue or other cell types on demand. So that said, uh, how do we engineer genetic circuits in the cell? So circuits are encoded in synthetic DNA. So here it's the picture of a bacterium that has its chromosome and the plasmid. So what people do, they extract the plasmid and they cut and paste synthetic DNA in that. Synthetic DNA encodes for genes that are creating essentially um, networks. So regulatory interactions create what people call circuits. So it's loosely speaking, networks now become circuits and interaction can be often externally controlled by chemical signals. So the key process that is the building block of most of the circuits or networks, as you may know, it's the process of gene expression, where you have a gene expressing mRNA, expressing a protein. And this process takes inputs. Inputs can be either activators so that they can enhance transcription, or they can be repressors, so they inhibit transcription. 
So at a high level, this process is a dynamical system that we represent with a node in a network. For example, in this case, you have a network where these interactions represent repressions, okay, like here. So we have three gene expression processes, each repressing one another. And this is a very famous network, is the repressilator, okay? So people working on oscillators know this system very well. And in fact, if you look at the movie, this is from the Elowitz lab that shows with the fluorescent protein, the concentration one of these proteins, you see they are oscillating in time. And if you look at the single cell traces, right, you'll see that uh, cells are uh, sustaining oscillations. So um, the way we will represent this network to this talk is through a deterministic dynamical system. So I'm going to assume throughout all the talk that molecular counts are large enough so that I can neglect stochastic effects. So stochastic talk would be for another um, uh, instance. Uh, and with that, the key question I'm going to address in this talk is modular design, okay? So um, here is an inspiration to engineering that was put forward in 2006. And the idea was to describe a sophisticated system as the composition of simple subunits as we do in many other engineering fields mm -hmm. so that whenever we compose systems and we go up in the layer of abstraction, we can forget about the details in the system and just reason about input output connectivity, okay? Mm -hmm. It's often the case, I have to mention that in engineering system, input output properties are often maintained by negative feedback inside modules, okay? Let's keep that in mind. So this analogy has been very tempting in engineering biology and has been proposed as a landmark for the way we design systems in engineering biology as well. And of course, the field has been very excited because the speed at which we can write and read DNA has been increasing at least at the speed of number of transistors per chip. And increased scale is becoming possible, but modularity is critical to manage complexity and time. So we would like ideally that the input output behavior of any two systems, when we compose them in the cell, doesn't change, okay? Otherwise, when I compose two systems and the input output property is changing, I have no way to predict the composition, right? Mm -hmm. So the reality is that in practice, modularity fails more than it succeeds in um, uh, this engineering tasks. So the reality is that whenever I have a system that is working and I connect one piece, I have to redesign the whole system again from scratch because whatever was there somehow changed. And these failures are really hard to parse. Mm -hmm. As an idea for a circuit with 11 gene, it still takes today one PhD thesis of five to six years, okay? Yeah. So that's problematic. So why is modularity failing? So the main point of this talk that I would like to get across is that modularity fails because genetic circuits are fragile to their environment. So as an example here, I have two circuits connected through input output. But right there, we have an effect like we also have in engineering of back action or loading, right? So anytime you are essentially transmitting a signal, so you always have a back action because whoever is listening to the signal is partially changing that. So yeah. this effect of loads scale up actually if you look at the circuit in the context of the cell. Mm. So the cell is providing all the enzymes for the circuits to function like RNA polymerase, ribosomes, and so on, they are being loaded. And as such, modules start affecting each other in a very indirect way, which is very difficult to untangle. Mm. Partially then we know that the cell has its own cellular circuitry that regulates growth rate, that regulates metabolism. You are interfering with that too when you are creating the circuit. So this applies back another perturbation, okay, to your circuit behavior. So the point of this talk is really is that all these red arrows that are entering your module can be regarded to a large extent as perturbations. And so the question we will be addressing this talk, how can we make the input output response of any of these modules robust to this red influences? Mm. So stated this way, 
this is a classical control system design problem. So control system design was born to handle robustness. If you don't have robustness, you don't bother in designing control system. You don't need that, okay? So as a result, uh, if you look at historically at the number of papers published at the intersection of control theory and synthetic biology, it has been growing at the same rate as the numbers of papers published in synthetic biology. So the community is growing. Uh, many more groups are starting to work on this problem um, because uh, there are a lot of very useful tools, okay? So let's now go back to the biology and let's pinpoint the one specific problem I will be focusing on in this talk. So synthetic genetic circuits are affected by their environment. And here we'll focus mostly on um, mammalian cells. So genetic contexts affect gene expression. So it's very well known that if you have a gene that is expressed, the surrounding genes, because of the supercoiling of the DNA, they are affecting the expression rate of that one gene you are interested about. So chromatin state in genetic circuits in mammalian cells is also problematic, okay? It's another regulation layer that is really hard to control and pinpoint. Cellular context, we have off-target interactions, we have resource sharing, we have growth rate feedback, your circuit is changing the growth rate of your cell, the growth rate change is changing the dynamics of your circuit. And then if you are looking at applications such as we work in where you are controlling the cell through cell fate transitions, mm -hmm. there are cell fate changes that essentially change the cellular context. Mm -hmm. There is also extracellular context, which is competition for nutrients with other strains, cell cell signaling and the cell niche. But in this talk, I will be focusing on this specific issue, which is the issue of resource chaining. And to get more into that, I will start with a summary of what we know about this in bacteria. Mm -hmm. So in bacteria, this problem has been, um, I will say, dissected really well by several groups. And so, for example, if you have this cell, you have cellular resources, and I have these two modules that are connected. So the first thing you know is that these modules are using up cellular resources. Mm -hmm. Cellular resources are changing, so every other module is mm -hmm affected by that. So one question you can ask, if I am activating a genetic module here, to what extent is the output of this supposedly unconnected module right here? Mm -hmm. So there is extensive experimental evidence, for example, in bacteria, in medium copy number plasmid, that if you are activating one genetic module, the other module is going to have an output that decreases up to 70% when you do so. And that's just because the resources specifically ribosomes are dropping when that's happening. Mm -hmm. Something more interesting happens when you have composition of genetic circuits. So if here you have two activators that are cascaded, the question is what is the emergent behavior of these two activators? Mm -hmm. Well, it's two heal function composed trivially, it would be an activation from U to X, but things can be rather different because again, anytime you're activating the first module, you're taking away resources from the other module. Mm. So you can actually get uh, all sorts of behavior from biphasic to decreasing to increasing. Mm. But nevertheless, so this type of network level effects in bacteria have been characterized experimentally and there are models available that are fairly predictive. And in a nutshell, what happens is that anytime you have an activator, it becomes an effective repressor because it sequesters resources by anybody else. Mm. And anytime you have a repressor, it becomes an effective activator because it's releasing resources for other systems. Mm -hmm. So this is what happens in bacteria at high level. So in this talk, I will ask, what is the consequences of resource sharing in mammalian cells? So is that the same or are there significant differences? And can we create predictive models and solutions for that? Mm -hmm. So. Therefore, in this talk, I will have the first part, which is creating these models to characterize resource sharing in mammalian cells. Mm -hmm. And in the second part, I will show you the design of controllers for isolating uh, modules from resource loading. So um, any questions so far? 
So very good to me. Uh, any question from audiences? I have a one question. Yeah, please. Why mammalian cells? Why not <laughs> the prokaryotic cells? <laughs> So um, in prokaryotic cells, we have been doing a lot of work since 2015. So I think in prokaryotic cells, um, these effects have been detangled uh, quite well. So, and we have predictive models. Uh, we have controllers too that have been built. So I think in prokaryotic cells, this problem has been uh, addressed quite for a long time but it wasn't clear what happens in mammalian cells. And the reason why we were interested in mammalian cells is because we are working with applications using mammalian cells and we are having issues. Thank you very much. And also there's also nucleus there, right? Yes, and in fact, we'll see that makes a big difference. Yeah. So, so uh, can yeah, I have I one question? So when you, um, so in this context, uh, I, uh, so are you having this uh, this constraint on the co total concentration of uh, you, for instance, in this case? Like yes. So um, if you look at both of our papers here, so we have mathematical models that use the conservation law for RNA polymerase and ribosomes. And uh, with that conservation law, then you are essentially going to see how these interactions pop up. Okay, so essentially you are ignoring all the possible inputs from the extracellular space, but the putting restrictions on the uh, this uh, total the level of these particular molecules that you're looking at. Yes, in fact, okay. uh, in bacteria, um, if you assume you are in exponential growth, um, then um, there are a few papers from, for example, Terence Was group that have shown that. Uh, during exponential growth, um, the total concentration of ribosomes and RNAP uh, is constant and it's correlated with the growth rate. Okay, got it. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so let's go back then to the mammalian question. So in mammalian systems, um, we started uh, with a very simple experiment. So we essentially considered a constitutively green gene, okay, which we call module one. And then we activated a red gene through an activator with an activation domain. Okay, so how does activation works in mammalian cells? So um, GAL4 is a DNA binding uh, protein. So it can bind specific targets on uh, a promoter. But in order to recruit transcriptional co-activators such as the mediator and other cofactors that are required to initiate transcription, it requires an activation domain, mm. okay? So essentially, DNA binding domain alone uh, doesn't do anything to transcription. So you need an activation domain that essentially recruits all the complexes that ultimately stabilize the RNAP binding. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what we did, we then uh, monitored the green output when we were essentially having um, no activation domain or GALF4 with two different activation domains. So VPR is one of the strongest activation domain. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you can see that the mRNA level of GFP uh, is actually reduced by 94% when we activate this module. If you look at the protein level, uh, you can see that the level decreases um, in a correlated way uh, with which the mRNA decreases. Oh. So here already we see a big difference with respect to bacteria, because in bacteria, there is no change to the RNA. So in bacteria, there is no uh, limitation, at least in the regimes we work with, uh, for transcriptional resources. While here it clearly says that transcriptional resources are a bottleneck. More interestingly, what you can see is that the activator expression sequester the resources even without the DNA target sites, because even without the DNA target sites, it can decrease the output here once it just has the activation domain. So that also tells you that the activation domain alone leads to resource sequestration. 
So transcriptional co-activators are the likely resource competed for, which essentially the activation domain is sequestering even in solution, it doesn't need a target, okay? So based on this information, then we created a mathematical model uh, where we essentially have our transcriptional activator, which in this case is GAL4 with the activation domain that can recruit co-activators. And specifically, we know that the major co-activator implied here is the mediator. And then it can bind DNA or first can be binding DNA and then recruit the co-activator. So bottom line, if you create conservation laws for the co-activators, RNAP and et cetera, and after a big set of algebra, you get a very nice expression for the rate of change of the apple protein. So this is essentially the production rate, which it's proportional to the co-activator here, but the co-activator free level, it's decreasing with the concentration of transcriptional activator because they are binding it, right? And so this is the Hill function, which is just the standard increasing function of UI. So you have U high here and you have U high here. So that means that there is another big difference with respect to what we have in bacteria, that if you look at the on target um, effect, um, it can be um, undetermined. So it can be monotonically increasing as it should be, but it can also decreasing because of this expression here. And that's because the activator can be bound in solution. That's not the case for ribosome sequestration in bacteria. So in bacteria, the on target uh, sign is never changed. Uh, just like in bacteria though, the off target interactions of course are repressions because you're sequestering resources from other uh, genes. So if you do an experiment, you try to validate this. So I'm going to plot the green. So module one output here and the red output to here. What you see is that as you keep increasing the activator, so that's UI in this, you'll see that the off target effect. So it start decreasing, but now let's see what happens when we change the activation domain, which means uh, decreasing the KI. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. so if we do that, you'll see that the effect of sequestration becomes more and more severe as the model predicts. And also the on target effect becomes more and more biphasic because after a point, there is this effect by which the on target um, uh, action, it's actually changing sign. Yeah. So that's the first uh, result of the model. So however, we were interested in understanding how generalizable this model is because we tried this in just hex cells for one specific promoter here, one specific promoter here. And so what we did, we did a big uh, library of promoters for our module one and a big library of activation domain and a library of cell lines in which we would um, uh, in fact, our genes. And so it doesn't matter essentially what the promoter is of the um, green G or what the cell line is. Anytime you see purple, it means that you have substantial effects of resource competition. So this is then telling us that, of course, some promoters are more sensitive than others, okay? But it's also telling us that the problem is um, pervasive across uh, cell lines. So this really motivated us to figure out a way to make modules robust to um, this resource uh, uh, variability. Mm -hmm. So before I move on to address these questions, are there any comments on this part? <laughs> I have a question about co-activator. Yes. So that is so co-activator is only present in eukaryotic cells or mammalian cells, not in the prokaryotic cells. So right. what are their functions? Say it again. What are the functions of a co-activators? Could oh. you uh, explain a little bit more? Yes. yes. So I can tell you a little bit more about one specific co-activator that we studied in more detail, which is the mediator. Mm -hmm. So the mediator is this um, uh, protein which looks like a hook. And so what it does, it binds the transcriptional activator 
and it binds to the promoter. And because of the hook, it stabilizes the RNAP binding. So essentially creates a big complex of proteins that make the RNAP very stable uh, at the promoter. Yes. So, uh, and that's just one actually of the many co-activators. There are also many other transcriptional cofactors that are required for elongation as well, which we haven't looked at in more detail. But the, the fact of the mediator and the fact that the mediator is limiting, it's something that people knew, I would say, from probably the 90s. Thank you very much. It's a very clean, clear, clear explanation. So is that the only and unique uh, limiting factor during the transcription process, or are there any other major contribution contributors? So for transcription, um, so we didn't do detailed experiments like knocking down some of these activators and or knocking or um, overexpressing them. But there is a series of uh, two or three papers in the 90s where they were using essentially mammalian cells as cell factories, uh, overexpressing genes that they looked in, in detail on uh, about specific transcriptional co-activators that uh, could be limited. Mm -hmm. And they screened for a number of them uh, just by modulating their level in the cell. And their conclusion was that the mediator was one of the most limiting ones. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Good. So then we can move to the second part, which is where uh, feedback control comes into picture or feed forward. Uh -huh. So here is the um, view that I will adopt in the second part of the talk. Um, I go back to my representation of my system with inputs and outputs. So inputs are transcription factors such as activators or repressors. And then I have protein outputs. And then I will look at disturbances as variations in this case of the level of resources. In this case would be, for example, the co-activator level that is changing because other genes are being activated, for example. So I will view that change as a disturbance of my genetic device, which in this case is going to affect the transcription rate. So what happens, right, if I look this in time, is anytime my disturbance is having a change, even if my regulatory input stays the same, my output is going to be affected by that. Hmm. What I would like to have is that that doesn't happen. So what I would like to have is that even if D is hitting the genetic device, I would like to be able to compensate for it. And one way to do that is to measure the output here and compare that in some way to the reference input and adjust, for example, transcription rate to compensate for that imbalance. So that's the basic idea of negative feedback control. Mm -hmm. The second approach that I will talk about is feed forward control. Mm -hmm. So with feed forward control, I am assuming that I can design a sensor of my perturbation. So if I can design a sensor of my perturbation, I can essentially post compensate its effect on the output so that my final output isn't changed too much, mm -hmm. okay? So either one, ideally if well-designed, should give me a situation where even if I am applied a disturbance, the desired output, it's initially being affected, but if I wait some time, the system is going to adjust, okay? And this property probably many of you know, it's sometimes referred to as adaptation, okay? So the system is adapting to a perturbation. So with that, I will start with negative feedback control and look at the question, uh, what ways do we have to engineer adaptation in engineering? And the most popular one is integral control. So integral control is essentially what you have in the cruise control of your vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have your vehicle that is going and you want to set speed like 50 miles per hour, and then the slope changes of the road, mm -hmm. the vehicle is going to adjust the throttle or the brake so that it can keep exactly the same speed. So that system is using an integral control. Mm -hmm. So what is integral control doing? 
So it's essentially measuring the output mm -hmm. and computing the difference and applying an action that is not proportional to the difference between the output and the reference input, but it's proportional to the integral of that error, okay? So if you apply this type of action under stability conditions of the whole closed loop system, what you can prove is that Y is going to be independent of the disturbance. And this is again, assuming that disturbance and inputs are constant, okay? So it is a constant change in the disturbance and the input is constant. Mm -hmm. So there will be another talk to figure out how to extend this to time varying, which is possible. Mm -hmm. And we have done uh, progress on that, um, but that's mathematically more involved and I can send you some references if interested. Mm -hmm. But in any case, what was the focus for a long time for us to be able to build an integral controller inside the cells is defeating the issue of leakiness. So if you have a plant, right, x dot equal f of x, z disturbance, mm -hmm. and z is your control action, and you like your control action to be an integral, mm -hmm. uh, you shouldn't have any leakiness here. But you do, because cells are diluting, sorry, are growing, and right. so molecules are diluting. Mm -hmm. So if you were to implement this in vitro, you will get a perfect integrator. But the moment you are working with a cell, uh, bacterial or mammalian, which is growing, you have dilution of cell species. And a lot of times you also have degradation, which is difficult to untangle because you have no specific degradation of proteins. Then the question is, you can set gamma to zero. So what we did instead is to increase the speed of the controller. Mm -hmm. So now if you put an epsilon, which is much smaller than one, mm -hmm. you have the integral part, which is much faster than the dilution. And what you hope is that you can roughly approximate the system this way, okay? In order to claim that if you have sufficiently fast mm -hmm. integrator action, you should be able at least a steady state to have the output Y equal to V and therefore it's independent of the disturbance, oh, okay? But in that case, if if you achieve the, your desire, the uh, control like B and Y becomes similar. Even one over epsilon is quite large. If B minus Y is small, then can we still say that it's dominant term? That's a great question. So, and that's why it took us a while to prove that. Oh. Uh, but yes, so we have a theorem in this paper mm -hmm. that says that um, if you can prove that the Jacobian of this system where you set gamma to zero, uh, it's um, uh, negative definite, mm -hmm. okay? So it has all the gamma with strictly negative real part, mm -hmm. then um, you can show that the equilibrium will be O epsilon from oh. B. Okay. okay. So mm -hmm. it, it's non-trivial. It requires a little bit yeah, of yeah. algebra. I see. Wow, that's yeah. cool. Um, but um, yeah, so then essentially we need to check for that structure and for that theorem to be satisfied when we implement uh, a controller uh, to uh, do that. Mm. So um, with that, then uh, we went and tried to figure out uh, in uh, uh, practice what molecular processes we can use to implement this quasi-integral controller. Mm -hmm. So um, it turns out that uh, phosphorylation cycles um, can work as a beautiful integral system. So what we have here is we decided to consider as a candidate feedback controller, uh, this phosphorylation cycle. So we have our input, which is a kinase, which is converting X to X star and X star is converted back by the output of your system, which is what you would like it to be regulated and independent of disturbances on transcription rate. Mm -hmm. And so the negative feedback, it comes in here. Mm -hmm. The question is whether this negative feedback can be in an integral feedback. Mm -hmm. So with that, you can write the standard Michael semantic kinetics for your phosphorylation cycle. So you have the phosphorylation term here. 
you have the dephosphorylation term here. BKs are the Michaelis-Menten constants of the forward and backward enzymatic reaction. And then you have the usual dilution. Now the output here, Y, uh, is going to have a transcription rate, which is going to be proportional to resources which are affected by the disturbance. And then X star is going to be an activator that um, we capture here with um, a simple heat function with E coefficient one. So the question is, can this equation implement an integrator? Mm -hmm. Well, it can. Mm -hmm. um, if you assume that both X and X star are much greater than K1 and K2, uh, which means that both enzymatic reactions are working in the zero order regime. And you take into account that molecular dilution is much slower than the catalytic rates okay, of these enzymatic reactions, mm -hmm. then you get your quasi-integral controller structure, okay? And so um, the next requirement you need is stability of the closed loop system, as we said before, and that's guaranteed by assuming that X star is not saturating, essentially, this function here. So as long as X star is not much greater than KD, the closed loop system is stable, you have your quasi-integral controller, and therefore, theory predicts that while in the open loop, the application of the disturbance will cause a change into your input-output transfer curve, the closed loop system would reject the disturbance perfectly. Okay? So any questions on this? Mm -hmm. Any questions from audiences? Looks good, I think. Okay, so <laughs> that said, we went ahead and tried to build the system. Uh -huh. So how do we build a phosphorylation cycle in mammalian cells such that it's interfering as least as possible with the mammalian circuitry? Mm. So we extracted- uh, Excuse me, yes. may I interrupt a little bit? Yeah. Yes. I, I wonder your uh, result holds uh, regardless of the regularity of R, the function R in, in this equation? It needs to be uh, continuous and mm -hmm. uh, bounded away from zero. Okay, okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so then what we did, we went into, um, uh, looking for prokaryotic uh, phosphorylation cycles that we could transport uh, inside the mammalian cell. Mm -hmm. And there is this very well studied uh, pair uh, with substrate on par uh, that can be phosphorylated to on par star. Mm -hmm. And the kinase is called MZ. And it's a very abundant um, protein uh, in bacteria. Uh, it's very well studied. And it turns out that uh, we were able to do a sequence of mutations of this protein to make it into an exclusive kinase and an exclusive phosphatase. Because it turns out that in bacteria, these enzymes are typically bifunctional. So they can work at the same time as a kinase and also as a phosphatase. Mm -hmm. So after doing a number of mutations, we were able to essentially get almost purely phosphodase and purely kinase activity. And then what we had to do, we had to engineer uh, binding sites for our protein here. So what we did, we just extracted the binding site from bacteria and placed it in the minimal promoter on the um, plasmids that we put in the mammalian cells. Mm -hmm. And then we have to fuse also the activation domain. Remember, so we need the activation domain in order to have activation of transcription in mammalian cells. So what I'm going to show here is the experimental characterization of these exclusive enzymes and exclusive phosphodase. So what I'm showing here is the um, output, the blue output here. And here now I'm changing the kinase. So you see that as the kinase is increasing, you get more output. 
And here I'm showing you the knockdown by the phosphatase. So as you increase the phosphatase now, you can see that the output goes down uh, by uh, two logs. Okay, so that's telling us that we have two good separate phosphatase and kinase. The last thing we wanted to do was a way somehow to tune the parameter epsilon, which is really important actually for um, achieving perfect or almost perfect adaptation. So what we did then uh, for the phosphatase, which is the one creating the feedback loop, we added a degradation tag, which we could modulate by a small molecule. So essentially by adding the small molecule, we could um, essentially make the phosphatase more or less stable so that we could decrease its level, okay, for the same uh, circuit. So here is the quasi integral controller that we built. So our output protein of interest, Y is the blue fluorescent protein. Then we linked with transcriptionally uh, the phosphatase here so that when the blue protein is expressed, also the phosphatase is expressed that it's dephosphorylating the activator here on par. So that's the negative feedback. And then we have the input kinase over here. The way we apply the disturbance was to activate a, a resource competitor, okay? So it's the same activator we had before. So when we add GAF4 VPR, we are essentially sequestering activators from transcription here. So here is the robustness to changes in valuable transcriptional resources. So here is showing the full change in the output when we are applying essentially a high dosage of a competitor. And you can see that the closed loop here in blue um, has a much smaller full change as compared to the open loop systems that are down here. More interestingly, if you compare the dose response curves of open loop and closed loop, so for the open loop, you can see that uh, without um, uh, GAL4, so with no competition, we have this response. Once we are adding this, the transfer curve goes down, but in the closed loop, they are much closer together. So you can also notice something that I won't have much time uh, to go in details. You have very high error bars here. So why is that? It's because of noise. So in the open loop system, uh, we have that. Uh, if you look at especially intermediate uh, kinase markers, we have that the distribution of the cell is very broad. So we have a high level of cell to cell variability, which is quenched actually in the closed loop system. Okay. So that's what um, uh, we also obtain with the system is a noise reduction, at least for the cell to cell variability. So um, unless there are any questions, I move to what we can accomplish with feed forward control. Sure. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yes. So in this diagram, uh, which component is the differences between closed loop and open loop? So in this diagram here? Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, model diagram, uh, the oh. biological system circuit. Yeah. In the, in the top. Uh, oh, in the top here? Oh, that's a great question. So the way we did the open loop is by substituting the phosphodase by a protein called Aflac which is a protein that doesn't do anything. So uh, essentially we are breaking that way, this loop here. Okay, I got it, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, in the uh, lower left figure the, on this slide, so uh, can I ask the meaning of like green one? What is, what is DDD plus DDD? Yes. So um, as I mentioned before, we added the degradation tag to the phosphatase mm -hmm. as a way to um, modulate its stability. Mm -hmm. So once we destabilize the phosphatase, we are essentially decreasing the feedback gain. So we are making that epsilon slightly larger. Uh -huh. And what you can see here is that when you do that, the closed loop system is still outperforming the open loop, but is not as good as the closed loop with the um, um, most stable phosphodase. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
So then the next question <laughs> is, um, what can we achieve with feed forward control? Okay. So um, feed forward control, I would say is the first thing to try if you're only interested in a constitutive promoter. So if you're interested in keeping a constant protein expression that you don't want to induce, feed forward control is really easy and effective. And I'll show you why. So um, here I'm going to uh, consider the following setup. I have my uh, steel blue protein that I'm trying to express. And then I have my shared resources mm -hmm. and I have competing modules, okay? So I'm just activating uh, transcriptional co-activators. I'm going to compare the open loop system uh, with a closed loop system where I am engineering a feed forward controller this way. So I'm going to co-express on the same DNA and with the same identical promoter an endoribonuclease. So an endoribonuclease is an enzyme that can recognize the target sequence on an mRNA of choice. And it's essentially starting the degradation of that mRNA. Okay, so that's an enzymatic reaction. So you can see from this diagram that if the resources are changing, for example, they go down, the endoribonuclease goes down, the apple goes down, so then this portion is going to compensate for the output going down because you have less degradation of the output mRNA. So essentially it's a feed forward loop, okay? So we have the resources changing, then our ERNA is changing, you have less degradation of the output. Mm -hmm. And uh, the expected behavior is that um, when resource loading by competitors increases, uh, the ideal behavior would be that your output stays constant. If you have the uncompensated system here, you are going to see, oops, uh, the blue going down. If you have the compensated system, in theory, you should have less discrepancy. Mm -hmm. So how do you design this? Well, it's the classical design of um, a feed forward loop. So we picked a specific enzyme here, it's called CASE. Uh, which has been very well characterized. And that's one of the um, fastest catalytic rates um, in the library that we got. And so what we did, we created a model for the system uh, where we are modeling essentially the uh, level of free resources here as your input to which you want to be robust, okay? And of course, it's a Michaelis-Menten type of response. So this region here is the desirable operation regime. So it's the regime where the output is not depending too much, okay, on the resource level. While in this gray portion here, if you change the resource, the output is going to change a lot. So what we would like is that this portion here is really small, okay? So we would like them to make epsilon very small. So how do we make epsilon very small? So it turns out that if you compute epsilon from your circuit model, you see that it's a constant in the numerator and the denominator, you have the concentration of Cassie. Mm -hmm. And then you have this, theta is the catalytic rate of the enzymatic reaction. And Km is the Michaelis Menten constant of the enzymatic reaction. So, the reason why we picked CASI among a library is that CASI is one of those with the fastest catalytic rate, so the largest theta that would help us reach the smaller epsilon. So then we wanted to um, probe this design by changing epsilon, okay? So what we did, we added upstream open reading frame that can change essentially the translation rate of CASI so we are changing the CASI level, so we can modulate epsilon. So what we are seeing here is that, um, so this is the no controller case. So you can see that once you are applying the competitor, the full change of the output, right, is negative here. With the controller, uh, you'll see that it depends on epsilon. So mm -hmm. down here, epsilon is larger because we have very low level of CASI that we uh, are engineering. But once CAS-C level is higher, you essentially have a flat line. So you are reaching essentially perfect adaptation for a good range of uh, input perturbations. 
And if you want to compare the no controller with the controller for the same level, mm -hmm. you can see that why the no controller shows a decrease here with the controller, essentially you have no change in the output, okay? So with that, uh, we actually wanted to again, test how generalizable this design is. So what we did, we tested the unregulated and regulated in a bunch of common cell lines. Because as I mentioned, one of the applications we have in mind is cell fate control. And once the cell fate is changing, the cell is going through different types and the background of the cell is changing. So we were curious to see how homogeneous could be the expression of the output across different cell backgrounds that have different resource levels. Mm -hmm. So here it's showing that if you look on the x-axis about the uh, expression level of your output in hex cells, which is our reference cell line, mm -hmm. and then you look in all the other cell lines, mm -hmm. you see that you have a big blur here in the unregulated system. But in the regulated system, they're highly correlated. So what this is telling us is that across different cell lines, this feed forward controller can keep fairly constant expression rate, which is actually what we need, especially in applications that go through sulfate changes. Something also uh, that we tested is the ability to attenuate a change in, uh, per, in resources in a specific cell line so we tested that in ac hella cho Biro, and um u cells and so you can see that without the controller you have some purple here that shows that you have a change in the output when we apply resource perturbation but with the controller we don't see as much of that so that's saying that our controller is keeping its disturbance attenuation property across um cell lines mm -hmm. so with that, I'm going to go through um, a summary, uh, unless there are questions. Uh, I have I... a question. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah uh, please go ahead, Dr. An. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I have a question about the growth rate after you control for robustness. And also another question is about the bi cell viability. When you control the, the ro robustness, then I wonder whether it, uh, growth rate or cell viability was changed as well. Yes, so actually in the supplementary information of this paper, we analyze the changes in uh, growth rate when we express, for example, the coactivator here, okay? So there is indeed, uh, if you overexpress it too much, the growth rate uh, decreases a little bit. And so, and in fact, in the supplementary information of this paper, we had to include that effect in the uh, model of the feed forward controller to see how that's going to affect the adaptation property. So you definitely have those effects and those should be included in the model, yes. I have another question about the, why do you tested this idea in different cell types? What kind of differences are you expecting from different cell types? Okay, great question. So we know that different cell types have different levels of transcriptional resources. And actually the transcriptional resources themselves may have molecular differences. And so therefore uh, we were curious to see if the controller could keep constant expression even if you have all these differences across cell lines. Hmm. Can I have a second question? Yes, please. About the speed, speed of a sensor or time delay during your mm -hmm. uh, the control. So you mentioned that the catalysis must be fast so that the feed forward control should work. That's yes. It? So is, is the same requirement applicable to the feedback control system too? You have to have a really fast sensor and is that, is that the, always the way or which one is better in terms of a, which one is more forgiving in terms of a time delay? Mm. Feed forward yes. versus feedback. So time delay in the feedback will more, a lot of the times create instability. Mm. So, and oscillations. Mm -hmm. So feedback, delays in the feedback are really difficult to handle. Mm. So, and you got it, got it right. If your sensor, um, so finite time delays are really difficult. If a sensor just has slower dynamics, 
is, is already a different situation, right? So maybe it has a low pass filtering behavior that you may handle, but delays are creating instability for sure. Mm -hmm. So which one is more forgiving, feed forward and feedback control? Oh, which one as far as delays is concerned? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, that's a great question. So we haven't compared in this situation, but for sure, the feedback controller, if you have delays in the feedback or a slow sensor, you can definitely get instability and oscillations. The four words, um, if you have delays, what you'll see, you'll see essentially a higher uh, overshoot or undershoot before you see the adaptation at the end. So it may take very long to adapt, uh, but it's not that the system is going to become unstable, okay? So in that sense, maybe it's more forgiving structurally, but in terms of finite time performance, they may be equally bad, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll go through a summary and tell you a little bit about what we are doing now with these controllers. Um, so summary wise, um, I told you a little bit about the issue of cellular uh, shared resources uh, for mammalian systems, especially, and pointed out has uh, how transcriptional resources seem the bottleneck in mammalian systems, while translational resources, chiefly the ribosomes, are the bottleneck uh, in bacterial systems. I've shown you a feedback controller based on phosphorylation, which is um, uh, feedback. It's useful anytime you're interested in a transfer curve that you want to make robust. But if you're only interested in having constant expression, uh, feed forward control, uh, it's much easier to implement. Mm -hmm. The um, critical point in a feed forward control is that the promoters here of these two systems need to be identical because you want to make sure that they use exactly the same resources. Different promoters may use different resources, so you may not have quite as good as uh, feed forward, right? So the two paths may be different. Mm -hmm. So I will just tell you one slide about what we are doing uh, right now with these controllers. So we are working on problems of um, reprogramming uh, 